All right, so here we are, episode three live. We are doing a batch recording. We had to finish the first episode in parts. I have like three files for the very first season that I'm gonna have to piece together. We've now done episode two, which was um, complete with some of the advertising in the podcast that I was playing. Uh, So I'm gonna have to edit those out. So hopefully this episode will not have any of that because the the least amount of editing there is, the better it is for me. So um, anyway, I'm excited about this case. This was one that uh, mom recommended. Unfortunately, she has a cold. So it's just me and my sister, if you want to introduce yourself, and then I will be quiet for several breaths after you say your name so that I don't interrupt you like I did the last episode. Oh, wait, let me do my Dracula one. <laughs> I'm Elena. Welcome to our podcast. <laughs> Go ahead, Sherry. And I am Sherry. And this is Outline of a Murder. Let me tell you why what occurred just occurred (laughs) and this video is going to be somewhere so we're in Greece but last week so here it is October 8th is when we're recording right and we're in what was it called not uh Naphili or Naphilon or not something some seaside was it yeah okay some seaside resort town in Greece and they have all these neat little shops you know so we go in this one because they sell local honey and we're with our mother and it's like this lady with crazy eyes talked real slow like she was trying to hypnotize you right (laughs) and so what do we do we leave mom in the store and we go out and hang out on the street (laughs) Mom was buying stuff too, and we're like, "Yeah, we're out." It, I just couldn't take it anymore. I because it was either. literally like the most intense, big-eyed eye contact. I'm like, "Stop it!" And then the slow, but. mesmerizing voice with the accent. So picture the accent. We don't think she was from Greece. Actually, we think she might be from Romania, guys. That's where you know Dracula was. For, Dracula. So. For real, if you. If you have watched Dracula movies, the way that he typically is portrayed and talks in that crazy eye contact, it was her. Yep. (laughs) So we were not mom's wing people. We were like, peace out. We're going to the street. (laughs) I mean, we we stayed, you know, we kept eyes. Yeah. But uh, the interpretation was not spot on. So I apologize, but... It was fun. Yes, it was. Okay, so our case um, today is the John Curtis Tolson, and how it turns out is going to make people angry because it was just um, resolved this year, 2023. Uh, But like I said, mom is the one that spotted this case, and it was perfect for our purposes of breaking down the cases, getting the key points, you know, so that we can help others recognize danger, red flags, and be smart. And by the way, we're not doing this from any place of arrogance, you know, like, you know, 2020, you know, vision, hindsight is 2020. It's nothing like that. It is literally, okay, what can we get from this to protect ourselves, but also hopefully to help other people in their lives? So I just want you guys to know that this is not armchair quarterbacking. This is literally, let's break this down and let's see if we can avoid becoming a victim. This is also, like we discussed in episode two on Crystal's case, another example of a person being way too nice. And again, that seems to be the victimology, those sweetheart people that give people way too many chances. And then for some, you know, it ends up in murder. So um, I wish she would have been uh, rude. And I'm not victim blaming. I just wish she would have. 
Okay. So at the beginning of this, I have in here, um, you know, the suspect is innocent until proven guilty. And I literally type blah, blah, blah. Well, I can say now for a fact that he is guilty because he pled guilty. So we'll get into that at the end. So let me um, show you some pictures of the victim. Her name is Leanne Fletcher. She was 38 years old. There she is. She looks really different in her pictures too. So like this is her, um, and she's older than she looks. Uh, and this is her house. It's a cute little house, little gray house. You can see it's well kept. This is a picture of her where she looks like she's, you know, 13, but she's not. And then this is my favorite. Like she, you know, the sun is, you know, obviously she's outside. The sun is in her face and she again, looks younger than she is. But at the time of this case, she's 38. And she's a single mother of two. She has a six-year-old son and a teenage daughter living in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. So, um, you know, people tell us that we don't look like we're as old as we are. I'm not sure if it's a compliment or not. Um, me being 50, you know, it's like, I want to look younger. But, you know, when you think someone's 50, it's like, oh, you're, you don't even look like you're that old. You know, does a compliment kind of go away when you put those two words together just saying right <laughs> so right her cousin trisha cahoon described her as quote a good person a good individual that had a heart of gold and it looks like she did in her pictures now i had a rough time getting an accurate timeline which because we know um, that the guy did it because he he pled guilty the timeline is not as important you know our mini series is going to be um this this uh winter is going to be on guilty or not guilty and we're going to dive into some of the cases like the al case who was that the peterson guy um yes who you just had the crazy eyes excited <laughs> yeah very Stop, I can't do this podcast with you doing that. Um, we're going to get into the Darley Rudier case, several of them. And there the timeline is going to be really important. Um, I, I'm going to go ahead and I think I'm going to throw in the the triad, the Petersons. So Scott Peterson, because um, the Al case is also a Peterson. I've been listening to the prosecutors on Scott Peterson, um, and they did what's called a legal brief. And it just eliminates for me any idea the guy is innocent. So I'm going to take really good notes from that because that's what they do for a living is they put together the case based on facts and they get all the fluff out of the way. But they also have several parts on that case where they break it down. So I think I'm going to throw that one in there because that one's controversial. Yeah, I know that me, you and mom have disagreed on that one. Mm -hmm. So interesting. Yeah, so we're going to kind of get into, you know, um, cases that people have just gone back and forth on. Uh, but in this case, you know, the timeline is very important in those. But in this case, I couldn't get the accurate timeline. Um, but it appears that Leanne went to Buxton to fish. I'm not sure how far away that is or anything. And I'm not even sure if she made it, actually, because three days after her fishing trip, she was found unconscious in her bathroom inside her home. The reason I'm not sure if she ever got to go fishing is it appears that she had been unconscious for two days. So, you know, did she go fishing and then she came back and was attacked and unconscious for two days? Or did she never leave the house? Um, she never made it to her fishing um, trip. So her roommate and later... It sounds like a casual boyfriend. So again, we have this casual relationship situation like we had with Crystal. Um, his name is John J. Curtis Tolson. He's 28. He called 911 and said that he found her in the bathtub. What is his name? John J. Curtis Tolson. So they called him J, but his name is John Curtis Tolson. 911, what's the address of your emergency? 990 Kitty West Kitty Hall Road. What's your name? Jay. And what's the phone number that you're calling me from? And tell me exactly what's happened. 
Uh, my friend, she's laying in the tub. She won't wake up. I think she fell last night. I'm not sure. There's blood coming out of her nose, so I can't get her to wake up. Okay. Do you think yeah. she fell? She's really heavily, like... Do you think she fell? Yeah, she has been okay. drinking. She okay. fell in the kitchen. How old is she? Uh, I think she's, like, 38. She's breathing really loudly. I just can't get her to wake up. Okay, are you, are you, all right, and you said she is breathing? Yeah. Is, and you said there's bleeding coming out of her mouth? Out of her nose a little bit. Okay. Paramedics to help you now. Just stay on. I'll tell you exactly what to do next. Okay. All right. And don't move her unless she's in danger and don't split any injuries, okay? Just stay on. I'm going to stay on the line with you as long as I can. Just watch her very closely and look for any changes, okay? Okay. What's he doing? He's just uh, sitting by the body. Okay, so I think that's the gist of it. So basically, for people that maybe had a rough time understanding, um, so he he sounds upset in the call, like his voice is shaky. And he says, my friend is lying in the tub and she won't wake up. So, of course, you know, the 911 operator is like, did she fall? And he said, yeah, I think she fell last night. I'm not sure. There's some blood coming out of her nose, so I can't get her to wake up. And he also mentions that she had been drinking. So this is July 22nd. And then you can hear him in the background saying, Leanne. And, you know, he talked about when he moved her, she started convulsing. Now she's just drooling. So at this point, you know, he's on the phone with 911 because she said not to hang up. He's calling out at her. Uh, she's not responding. And, um, and, and she has been in this state for two days. So the paramedic, now he doesn't say that on the call. Later we learn that she had been in that state for two days. Paramedics and police arrive on the scene. Uh, she's immediately rushed to the trauma center at uh, Centera Norfolk General Hospital. She is alive. And because it's a suspected fall, the police don't go into the house. So they think that she, like he says, she fell in the kitchen. Why is she in the bathtub? I mean, that would be a question I would want to know. If she fell in the kitchen, she should be located in the kitchen. So, Mr. Police Officers, who annoy me in this case, why, like, did you not know she was in the bathtub? Did you not know he said that she fell in the kitchen? 
how did she get in the bathtub? So I'm really aggravated about that because this is actually a crime scene. And I will put the crime scene photos up on the website so people can see the amount of blood that was all over that house. So they don't go into the house. Leanne never woke up and she died July 25th, just three days before her 39th birthday. Yeah. So a few things. There's blood all over the house. He only mentions blood from her nose. He also was very quick to say, I think she fell last night. How would he know that? And why is that relevant at this point? And that she had been drinking. Yes. Now, some of that will become apparent why he was there. Uh, But Leanne's family, they were not buying this from the start. So they immediately felt that Tolson was involved in whatever it is that occurred. The trauma surgeon confirmed their fears. He told Cahoon that there were holes in the story of a fall and that her cousin's injuries didn't support a fall. So they hired a PI because they could not get the police to investigate. I'm like, why would you not investigate? A 38-year-old woman has fallen so severely that she is unconscious for several days and dies. Like, how would you even think that would be normal for a 38 year old to fall on that level? Now, if she fell off stairs and hit her head on a concrete floor or something, yes, but she falls in a kitchen. I mean, you know, you got like, maybe if she hit her head on the granite, but it doesn't seem like from the start, they really cared to investigate this case with any depth. And I don't like that at all. Yeah. Um, so Cahoon said that they had called the DA every day for two weeks, could not get the DA to respond at all. Police would give them the runaround saying, well, we're waiting for the autopsy. Um, but again, there needed to be some examination into this. Later, it was determined that she died of blunt force trauma, but they labeled the death as undetermined instead of homicide. Don't get it. Sounds like an interesting town and system. Yes, it does. Okay, so the private investigator did go into Leanne's home after her death, and he captured a video, which I'll have that link in the show notes, of what Cahoon, you know, again, the cousin, described as a massacre with blood everywhere in the bedroom. Yeah, blood-soaked pillow, blood-soaked mattress, a towel, a red jacket covered in blood. And so they recovered or recorded all of it and they posted on social media with the hashtag justice for Leanne. So the um, music that was at the beginning of the video that I didn't know was going to be so long that I may edit it out. So if you don't hear it, that's because I did. Um, right before the 911 call, that video is what has the the crime scene video of the, the P.I., They put it on social media in an effort to pressure the police to actually investigate the crime and to get them out of their, quote, no sense of urgency in investigating um, this case. So now this, again, is nuts. I'm like, you have paramedics that go in, she's in the bathtub, and no police officer goes in the house. I, I'm just flabbergasted at this situation. It reminds me of when we had the fire across the street and the man that escaped, it's like he needs an ambulance. He escaped a fire and there was an ambulance down the street. And I'm like, Hey, I told 911, we have a person who escaped the fire. Oh, you told 911 there was a person who's yes, this is him. He needs an ambulance. I said, can you send that one down there to take him? Oh no, that's for the firemen in case they need an ambulance. So we waited for 20 to 30 minutes, maybe longer. And he ended up dying. And we later found out that if there is a fire escapee, you have to immediately get them on oxygen and immediately get them to the hospital or their lungs can start getting sticky and they can't breathe. And that's exactly what happened. But let's not use the ambulance down the street. So it reminds me of that situation and that these people don't care enough to go in the house and verify the story this dude's telling them. Exactly what it is. It's not even urgency. It's 
simply do not care for whatever reason. Yeah. And you would think again, like, why would we take the word of this guy? Did they even do a background check? Did they even care enough to find out if this guy is legit? Don't know. Eventually, they did get the comforter, the fitted sheet, and the pillow. Um, but, you know, obviously, the family see in this scene and they notify the police, hey, there's a crime scene here. So at some point, they do get it, uh, the evidence. And you can imagine the comments on this, you know, that they post this video because the cops don't care. I mean, the community was very angry that the cops weren't doing anything and they weren't being proactive. So the police assure, you know, th that they're working on it and they ask them, quote, to be patient and allow us to conduct this investigation in an, an objective and thorough manner. Well, there's nothing objective or thorough about their actions so far when the family has to spend their own money to hire someone to investigate it and they discover the crime scene and they're still dragging their feet. So they won't do their job. Yeah. Getting a little, getting a little fiery here. Now to give the police the benefit of the doubt, if they had taken those items out of the house before the PI videotaped the rest, like, did they? And maybe the PI only got the aftermath. I don't know. Maybe they were working on it. It's a little bit confusing on whether the police did take those items, but most of the reports I read was that they didn't even go into the house. So I'm thinking that's what happened, but I just want to throw that in there. Also, since when do you wait for an autopsy? If you have a 38-year-old who is unconscious, who fell, to me, there's an immediate investigation. The autopsy is being conducted while you work, right? Like, I, I've never heard of, well, we have to wait until the autopsy. Well, no, you immediately start investigating the scene. Especially um, with all the blood. Exactly. Which they wouldn't have known if they didn't go in as it's been reported. And then again, why is she in the bathroom, the bathtub, if the blood is in the bedroom? And then why is he saying she fell in the kitchen, right? So everything is just, there's blood everywhere. And um, and then on top of that, yeah, and he didn't even tell her family. He didn't tell them that she was hurt. He didn't tell them that she was in the hospital. He didn't tell them nothing. Mm-hmm. Huh. Pretty darn suspicious. So then the autopsy shows the blunt force trauma, of course, but it also shows his bruises on her shoulder, arms, breasts, abdomen, and chest. So she was obviously beaten. They also learned that she laid there for two days and that the blunt force trauma caused a bleed that worsened as she laid there. Obviously, lack of oxygen, organ failure. So what that means is that if he would have called an ambulance after he beat her, she might have lived. So he basically let her suffer for two days. Now, who exactly is this Tolson poop bird? He was a resident of Hatteras, North Carolina. I'm not sure how the two met at, you know, like where and how and all of that. But Tolson told Leanne, at wherever they had interactions, that he didn't have a place to live because he'd been kicked out. Leanne felt bad for him and offered an extra room to him. Again, if you're single, please don't invite males into your house to stay. Even if you feel sorry for them, there's a reason he got kicked out. I would want to know. Like, don't take his word for it. Yep. Okay, well, give me the number of the people so I can call and see why you got kicked out. Or better yet, just don't go there and he'll figure it out. He'll find a place to stay. They always do. So, yeah, And if you feel bad and want to help... See if you can set them up in a cheap hotel for a couple of days. That's a good idea. And then they have like, you know, shelters for the homeless in a lot of communities. They have organizations that help people that are down on their luck. So if you want to do those things, don't invite them into your home. And I don't know where her kids were at this time either. I don't know if they were living with her, they were living with the dad or grandparents or someone else. I don't think they were there. You know, because obviously... You would notice mom's in the bathtub and you would notice the blood all over the place.
Yeah. Not only that, as far as not inviting people into your home, you don't know, especially if he was somewhat of a stranger and you've got a little one or, you know, even a teenager. No, 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 no. Yeah. Because you just don't know. Especially yeah. now. Don't allow you feeling bad for someone to throw common sense out the window and possibly put you in danger. I don't care how long you've known them. I mean, you, there's people that you've known, you know, people have known all their lives and they're child molesters or they're violent when they drink, you know, so it just doesn't matter. I just don't think it's smart for a single mom for sure. Again, not victim blaming. So on top of her letting him in her house, their friendship turned into a relationship, but it wasn't long before she was scared of him. And I'm not sure what, I don't know what exactly happened, but she put his belongings out on the front porch Monday, July 20th. So remember, he calls 911 July 22nd. So I'm pretty sure that's when he lost it. Cahoon said that Leanne had started packing his stuff and removing his stuff from the home and that that was the last anybody heard from her. The time was from 4.30 to 5 that Monday afternoon. She was discovered two days later. So this tells me that they possibly got into a fight when Tolson returned and saw his stuff on the porch, that he beat her to death at that time and let her slowly die in the bathtub in an attempt to make it look like an accident. He also fled the area going to Bangor, Maine um, for rehab. So he, he beats her. He leaves her, he goes to Maine to rehab. So he's obviously on some type of drugs, but what on earth? Like, did he, did he go after he called 911? Did he go after he beat her and then changed his mind and went back and called 911? I'm thinking it's after he called 911 because again, the police didn't seem to care about the case. And there's no telling um, what drugs he was on, too, that can make him violent. Well, alcohol rehab is also a thing, too. That's true. Um, another thing is, is I mean, she was kicking him out. She had his belongings outside of the house. There's zero reason for to open the door, him to come into the home. If, you know, that situation occurs, Um Likely, if he did lose his temper, lose his crap, just call the police. That's a good uh, thing to point out because uh, we had a case that um, you didn't sit in on last year where the woman had kicked him out and he had smooth talked his way back into the house and killed her and her daughter. And uh, so that's true. There's no point in letting them back in. In fact, if they make you nervous, maybe have a sheriff there when they show up. That is something that sheriffs can do. So with all of the evidence, the family's PI gathered up and the suspicious circumstances of Leanne's death, a grand jury did indict him for her murder. Now, um, at the time that I wrote the script, uh, which was April 7th, 2023, he had not gone to trial. Here is where people's going to get mad. And people are going to get mad. And this is a, is a short case because there's really not much to say. And we've, you know, kind of basically like, Hey, these are some things to do to protect yourself. But I did find out yesterday when I was reading my notes on this case and I was trying to find the 911 call, I fa found out that he pled guilty for manslaughter and the DA took the guilty plea. So he doesn't even get convicted of murder he gets manslaughter. What's the difference? Murder means, obviously both are a felony, but it means that he'll get more time. Manslaughter, he'll probably be out in a few years. So my sister's is face is sitting there. Is <laughs> more like, huh? For the, the dead silence, my sister's sitting there thinking, if you're wondering why I just let the silence occur. So is manslaughter whenever you harm somebody and then they die later from their injuries, that sort of thing? It sounds familiar. Manslaughter is where it's considered more of an accident. That if it wasn't for your actions, the person would be alive, but it wasn't necessarily murder. In other words, you didn't mean to kill them. Oh, yeah. 
Are you freaking kidding me? No. That's why I said you're going to be mad oh, at the beginning. <laughs> that town is fabulous. Yeah. Great justice system. Yeah, that's what I thought. So you don't investigate, you could care less, and then you let this dude plead down to manslaughter. I mean, it makes me furious. The only thing I could see is if, you know, like he was super, super drunk, she was drunk, and he says, well, we got into a fight, and I I pushed her. But that's not what happened. She had bruises all over her, her abdomen, her chest, her um, arms. I mean, he beat the crap out of her. So it's really frustrating that they let him plead out to manslaughter, but that's what he did. So I feel that he, like cocaine, will change a person's personality where they get very aggressive. Meth can also do that. So obviously he's either on some type of hardcore drug Or he gets violent when he drinks, which that does happen to some. Like, you know, we were talking some red wine can, like, I, it, out of all the wines, red wine, I can get a little aggressive and not on all of them. So white wine, no, I'm good. And, and I don't even drink, like, I don't drink to get drunk. I can, I remember one time sitting around the table with the kids and we were just having a, you know, a reasonable glass of red wine. And I'm getting to the end, and it was a certain brand, so I don't know if certain brands, you know, make you more prone. I have no idea, certain types of grapes. But I remember sitting there thinking, man, I'm feeling aggressive. I'm like, why am I feeling aggressive? And I was like, oh. And so I just set it down. I didn't even finish the glass. So, you know, maybe he was um, an alcoholic. Something, though, occurred to make her scared while he was living with her. And so she saw something. Maybe he was erratic. Maybe he was abusive. Maybe he got abusive when he was high. I don't know. Either way, she decides he needs to go. The fact that he, that she let him live with her, it's a kind gesture. They're friends. He's 10 years younger than her. I'm wondering if maybe the age difference didn't alert her to the danger she was in so like here's what I mean obviously she saw something that scared her but here's a 28 year old kid that she's gonna let let live with her that's what I mean that maybe because he was a young kid to her which I mean obviously she's only 10 years you know older but still she's gonna think this is just a 20 something down on his luck I wonder if that removed any element of, hey, this isn't a good idea to let him live with you. Makes sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it, it doesn't matter. You know, he's a 28-year-old man. And men are naturally stronger than most women. And so either way, you're at a disadvantage. And it looked like she was a little thing, too, that she was pretty petite. So, yeah. Yeah. um. Okay, let me get on down. The other thought that I have, and then I would love um, to hear what you think, but I would say, uh, as far as like being proactive, so if you're the family of the victim, don't let the, like, how do you say it? I think we have a natural tendency to trust certain people. So, We have a nat, well, I don't, but most people have a natural tendency to trust their doctor or to trust a judge because they're wearing a black robe or trust the police because they're supposed to serve the public. They're supposed to do their job. Don't trust anybody. You know, like I don't trust my doctor. I ask questions. I know what my body needs. I push back if I don't agree with something. And I don't trust judges. They can be corrupted, they're human. They can make mistakes. I dang sure don't trust lawyers and I don't trust the police. I appreciate good police officers and I appreciate good police work. I don't trust them. And we've done too many cases where police were just as jacked and murdered people as well or state troopers that were raping women in their cars. So don't ever trust anybody just because they have a uniform. So if you are the family of a victim, be bold like this family was. I I firmly believe if the family hadn't posted the crime scene video on Facebook, 
I don't think they would have done anything. I think that her death would have remained undetermined and he would have gotten off scot-free. And then the fact that he only got manslaughter is ridiculous. She did not get any justice. Agreed. And what I would be interested to know if there's any sort, if there's anything that the family can pursue for some consequences or some sort of justice against the DA, the police officers, and even the coroner. I would think that maybe the only thing they would be able to do would be to go to the state attorney general. Uh, if, if they are not happy with the, um, the DA in the plea agreement, I think that's their only recourse. And I have heard of that being done where a state attorney can look at the case and be like, no, we're not going to accept this plea. You guys need to take this to trial or you need to come up with a more severe punishment. So that's a, a great idea that people maybe can do is like, if you're not happy with the way things are happen, happening, go to the state attorney uh, general's office and see if maybe you can get some justice. Now, let me ask you this. He pleaded, so DA, he pleaded manslaughter. The DA accepted it, but has the judge signed off on it? Because I've heard where judges um, have rejected pleas. That's a good idea. Let me... Um, or a good question. Let me share my screen so that you can see the poop bird. And then uh, let me see if I can find real fast the uh, case. So that's him. And you know what's interesting? He looks like his face looks kind. Like he looks friendly. But notice the smirk. Yep. That's what I was going to say. Poop bird. Yes. Okay. So uh, John Curtis Tolson, let me see, ends early with a guilty plea. So this is, um, look at him now. Oh, that's crazy. Smiling, smiling. long yeah. hair. Go, like he looks like a killer there. Okay, so this was August 31st. He pled guilty to voluntary uh. manslaughter. Um, yeah, Judge, there it is. Okay. A class D felony. He may serve up to 204 months in prison. Uh, they said told, oh, so the judge who is presiding over the case said that he had no significant criminal history prior to this case before sentencing him to four to eight years. Oh, what? Yeah. So yeah, he's sentenced. So he's in custody. Um, oh, and he further ordered that he be given time served while he waited for trial, which was three years. So, oh, so he could get out in a year. That is just crap. I don't like Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. I'm just going to let everybody know. Uh, this is ridiculous. The family... Um, were crying during the proceedings. Okay, so here's where it might clear up the main thing. At the time of his arrest in Maine, so I guess that's where he was arrested, Tolson had been out maybe a week after attending a rehabilitation program for about a month. So the judge said... That's all. Sorry. I'm glad you received treatment for your drug issues, and I hope that you can continue to hold on to that. That's what the judge oh, tells God. him. I really hope someone goes above all of them for s some sort of justice. Because wow. obviously the whole justice system is either corrupt or just doesn't care. Yeah. Yeah. The forensic pathologist um, in testimony that lasted over two years, so I'm, I'm assuming that he pleads guilty and then they hear from the family and other people that right there noting bru that. noting bruises and other injuries on Fletcher's body that were not consistent with medical interventions so that means that they had to have come mm. from him most no notably a large subdural hematoma which is blood on the brain and which would have required a significant degree of force 
injuries on both forearms and the backs of both hands, suggesting engaged in a physical struggle as those are common injuries of people defending themselves from attack, multiple bruises inside her right thigh, a large bruise on her buttocks and wounds on her knees and lower legs, and a toxicology report indicated no presence of drugs or alcohol in her body, like he said. So yeah, basically, basically he beats the hell out of her, and then the judge feels sorry, more sorry for her or for him than he does for the victim. Hmm. Yep. He said, uh, it is in his best interest to accept the plea agreement, which also brings some measure of closure and of healing to everyone that's been involved. Mm hmm. The judge did. Yeah. Yeah. The judge said, so basically, we, uh, we gave you guys, uh, justice. So move on. Yeah. Yeah. You should feel healed now. So I think that definitely, like we talked about, don't allow someone to stay in your house. Don't, if you're kind and you feel sorry for people, that does not require the response of helping them to the point where you're put in danger. It just doesn't. I do think the way he looked at the time, he did look like kind, like a normal person, His age, again, maybe she didn't recognize the danger, but seeing his cocky attitude in court, smiling, and now he actually does look like someone who could be dangerous is very annoying. And he might even be out by now for all we know, or maybe in a year or two. It's ridiculous. This case makes me mad. (laughs) But it was a good one to do for our purposes. So any final thoughts? No. Yeah. <laughs> On that note, he's a poop bird. Yep. All right. Our tagline, which I don't think we did the last case. We did not. <gasps> oh, my goodness. Okay. You okay, do so your part. Oh, wait. What? Well, what is my part? The first part. Be smart. Oh, yes. Because I like to um, articulate the T's. Be smart. And then since I'm usually rude, be rude. And don't be a victim. Outline of a Murder is a Mr. Joseph production. What do you think, Joseph? (laughs) Joseph.